And there's nothing like spreading the word of the science of the environment and what's going on. It's, it beats everything, you know, all the media channels and so on. They're great, but to actually see it is, is, is the best, I think. Because I know that there's this regulation in Antarctica. Is, is that right? I mean, does that, does that, is that sort of limiting the number of people who can come or how does that work? Well, actually, no, there's not, there's not as much regulation as you think there is. Okay. So the tourist ships, most of the tourism is uh, on cruise ships. And there is a body called IATO that regulates, that has their own regulations, which is really good. Um, but there's no limit on numbers. And I think that's one of the things, that's where the science comes in, because the scientists are doing a bit of work to look at, um, the impact of tourism, you know, a lot of them go to the same penguin colonies or go to the same sites. Is that the right thing to do in the future or should we spread the impact? And so there's quite a lot of work on that. Um, thank you very much, both. Um, great question. We've got one from uh, Haverford West High VC School in Wales who would like to know, do you find dead or extinct species frozen in the ice as it melts? I think it's the one for Jane. <laughs> yeah. I think this is a Jane question. Well, the classic ones, of course, are in, in Siberia and other places where we find the mammoths. And, you know, in the permafrost, sort of the frozen ground in Siberia, all sorts of animals are coming out now. And I've seen some amazing, um, actually, TV programmes looking at the things that have been um, melted out from, you know, the permafrost is melting very fast. So there are mammoths, but I've also seen pictures of a little um, cub, a lion cub, that lived hundreds of thousands of years ago, not millions, but hundreds of thousands. And, and it's got fur on it, and it looks like a little lion cub that was uh, asleep yesterday. And there are birds with their feathers on. So the, the ice really does preserve animals and birds beautifully. But they are melting out, unfortunately. And as soon as they melt out, they will decay because the ice is preserving them. Brilliant. Uh, this one uh, might be for you, um, Nick, but the second half could be for Jane, um, which is how how do you dispose of waste oh. um, in Antarctica? And, and is there a treaty? Uh, and how does the Antarctic Treaty then dictate life? Um, yeah, on a sort of practical basis, yeah. you, we're very, very careful. I think that's the, the first thing to to make sure that our, our footprint on the, the the Arctic and the Antarctic is as minimal as minimal as possible, and we do I think a, a great job of of minimising the amount of waste here in the Arctic where we are at the moment. We have a waste management system that has I think it's twenty six categories, and we start in our home nations where we try and strip down and 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 and, and limit the amount of waste or or potential waste coming up to the Arctic, and that's the same in the Antarctic. So we pay huge attention to it. Um, cleaners on washing machines and and the detergents that we use, of which we use very, very little, uh, we're just ultra careful. Hmm. So in Antarctica, mostly now, most of the what we call national programs of the countries, they remove all their waste. So um, they everything goes out. So any kind of waste that you have, any packing, any, any things, but also human waste and even things what we call grey water. So if you use water to wash or wash up or something like that, that gets put into barrels and then that's taken out of Antarctica. So we try and leave no sign that we've been particularly in the field, uh, uh, you know, in a campsite. Um, and in a station, um, we have uh, the waste facilities where we package everything up, crush it, and then it gets taken back home and put in proper recycling facilities. And that's when the ship comes. Sort of, Absolutely. You know. yep. yep. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, this is a question from Amaya. Uh, hi, Amaya. Um, I think it's about sort of more shipping in the Arctic as, as we see less ice. Um, do the boats, when they go through the ice coming to the Arctic, have an effect? What is it? Might, what might be an effect of increased... Arctic no. shipping. So, hello, Amaya. Um, yes, now this again is a really important science uh, project for marine biologists because uh, as the shipping will increase in the Arctic, which I, I think it really will do, it has done as the ice disappears, the scientists are trying to understand pollution from more ships they're under, uh, and the impact on the ocean water and all the creatures in the ocean. But they're also interested in the noise of the, that the ships make and how that affects things like whales and some of the marine creatures. 
because there is has been some research that shows that they they are disturbed when they hear the the noise of boats and the noise of some uh, expir expiration equipment. And um, I think also as the ships go by, there's also a, a worry that the the ships themselves are bringing in pollutants. So ships have have a uh, uh, ballast water to to, 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 to um, make them equal weight, and they take the water from another ocean and they can then let it out in the mm. Arctic Ocean, and that can have a big mm. impact yeah. on the animals that live yeah. there. They, so, also, they yeah. also have um, anti-fouling paint, which you paint the underside of ships with to stop barnacles and weeds growing. And actually the shipping industry, much driven by our scientists here and in the rest of the world, but particularly here in the Arctic and down in the Antarctic, who've studied the effect that these uh, anti-fouling paints have had tributyl tin that's having on the very simple ecosystem that we have up here, and that's driven to uh, the banning of using these chemicals. So it, it, uh, it's it's improving, I would say. Would you say? Mm, absolutely, yeah. yeah. The next question is about climate change. Um, it's a little bit of a different angle, uh, and it's it's how does being up here make you feel about climate change? I know we've been talking about this sort of at the station this week. But how how does sort of being in the polar regions and and sort of seeing some direct effects make you feel? Yeah, you can actually see it, you know. And I've been coming back here to the Arctic for several years now, well, for many years, and you can actually see the changes. And the one thing I notice always flying over some of the glaciers here in the Arctic is they look unhealthy to me. I mean, <laughs> I mean, a, a good a good healthy glacier would be yeah. nice and high and plump and white, and it would go, you know, down towards the sea. And as as I've flown over them over the years, you can see that they're shrinking, mm -hmm. and they're sh they're shrinking backwards, but they're also flattening. They're they're not so deep, and they they're grey because they're covered in a lot more um, debris, rock debris on the sides. Um, so it just doesn't look nice. And of course, we can see the glaciers, the big glaciers themselves, going back and back and back as they as they. And, and on, a, on a personal level, does that how does that make you feel? How does it make me feel? Well, as a geologist studying ancient climate change, the one thing I really understand now is how fast the climate is changing today, much, much faster than anything that I've studied in the past. And so to be able to see the change year upon year upon year, it is it is quite worrying, you know, it's quite frightening. And, and I really hope that we can do something about it by cutting our carbon footprint so that we can really stop CO2 from rising any further or at least slow it down a lot. Thank you very much, Jane. Nick, I mean, your, your feelings on, on seeing... Yeah. How, I mean, how, how, how long have you been coming to, to this part of the Arctic? 40, something like 45 years ago, I think, when I first first came here to Svalbard, here to New Orleans. So um, things have changed enormously, and it does sadden me. As, as Jane said, um, the many of the glaciers, particularly the coastal ones, look very sort of dull compared to what they were. They still look beautiful, but they've lost that luster that they have. And by the end of the summer season, some of them are looking almost sort of thread-like yeah. rather than, a, as you say, a good plump glacier. But uh, <laughs> other sort of things, we get more rain. Uh, oh, only yes. um, a month ago, yeah. um, there was a record high temperature. It's something like the 14th, 15th of March here. We had plus 5.5 degrees centigrade, just a crazy temperature to have when we should be as we are now, which were about minus 16 or something. We used to get temperatures down. I was up here in 86. We had temperatures down to minus 48. And, uh, and it was hard, hard cold. And we wouldn't think twice about it being minus 30. Now, if we get to the minus 20 or... Mm. Well, we we think think that's that's quite cool. But one of the biggest sadness is is the the lack of sea ice, which which Jane touched on earlier, and of course the big consequences of that. But just as a as a sort of an emotional thing, it it um, is very sad to look out and see a seascape when it should be frozen. And of course it is so warm. We're getting Atlantic cod coming up here. They're predating on species that should be native here in the fjord and. Just things are a little bit topsy turvy. Thank you, thank you very much, both. You, you, you've both had sort of incredibly wonderful careers in the polar regions. Um, how did how did it all start? And um, what what Jane? What was the sort of the 
the moment for you where you went, yes, I'm 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 going to head off and into into the polar regions and and, and research them. Well, it was never anything anything that I imagined I would do when I when I was a child when I was at school. I really liked geography at school, physical geography, and then I studied geology, mm-hmm. so rocks and and the formation of the earth. And I realised that's what I was really interested in. Um, what, what happened then? And I, I went to university to study geology and became interested in fossil plants. Okay. So I, I was a researcher in fossil plants, and it was that research interest that took me first to the Canadian Arctic. So I was asked by the Canadian scientists to go and look at fossil forests in the Canadian Arctic. And from then I went to work in other parts of the Arctic. I went to live in Australia that actually was also studying ancient climates. Then I came back to the UK and continued as my research thread, trying to understand what the earth was like in the geological past and how things had evolved. And of course now, Oh, and then, and I focused on more on the polar regions. So now I'm I'm really interested in what's happening now in the polar regions. And in fact, what what can we learn from the past that's telling us about what what our future will be? Amazing. And and would there be sort of one thing in terms of learning from our past? Has has there been a message from the past that you've been particularly sort of seized upon? As, as a as a key message? Well, I think the one thing you can notice from the past is, well, geologically speaking, when we work over millions of years, you know, we can see change. But one thing that has made me realise is how fast the change is now. If you go back about five years ago, you know, I was saying, yes, we're going to change because carbon dioxide levels are going up. But I mean, I am really surprised now how fast the climate dioxide levels are going up compared to probably what it did in the past. Very unnatural. Very unnatural. Thank you, and and thank you very much, Jane. Um, Nick, you're. I mean, how how did, how did you end up in the polar I, region, my, regions? My dear parents gave me a soft back book of that, that sort of dimension called the Puffin Picture Book of Polar Exploration at the age of six, and that was it. <laughs> I was going, and there was nothing going to stop me. And uh, it just hit the spot, my imagination, and, uh, you know, never would dream of space travel or whatever, but it was the nearest thing to it. It was just uh, so unknown, so, uh, as I said earlier, you know, part of the planet that human beings really shouldn't be, and uh, and that was it. So the minimum age to join the British Antarctic Survey, <laughs> your British Antarctic Survey, Jane. I uh, I joined at 21, which was the minimum age. And uh, yeah, very exciting time. And uh, and as I say, this through that time, I've seen hundred upon hundreds of amazing scientists doing the work that they do and these huge changes that's happened over that time. So I never cease to be amazed, one by by the polar regions, but never cease to be amazed by the scientists who yeah. carry out the work. I think that there are some people who really like the cold. And so you come here once and you really like it and you keep coming back. You're absolutely attracted. I mean, I hate the heat and I hate humidity. So I would never, ever choose to work in the tropical, tropical rainforest. No, no, please take me to a cold place. But I mean, when you, I mean, when you both sort of, I don't know what your first experience was like. I mean, when you go to these places for the first time and you have, you've got the Puffin book of, of mm-hmm. polar exploration <laughs> or you, you have a geology textbook and you sort of think, okay, well, this is, or, or a lecturer. Did, did any of it prepare you for that first sensation yeah. of, of these polar regions? What, no. Nick, what, what, I mean, no. how did you arrive in, in, uh, in the Antarctic? I arrived by ship and it took uh, two and a half months from the UK to, for a, went ashore in Antarctica. And first of all, you're seeing people who are acclimatized to it and have got used to the cold and are living it. Um, at that time, it was very isolated or more isolated than it is now. Um, we got a hundred words every month, communication, no telephone, no, of course, no emails or faxes or anything in those days. Um, there wasn't much vegetable. To eat. It was all dried, dried food, dried food, and um, <laughs> and and of course, then it was just letters, and they letters arrived every year. We wait for two and a half years, so it was, you know, when a bag of letters arrived, usually around Christmas time, which of course in the Antarctic is midsummer, 
that was very exciting. So it was, um, it really was entering a new world. Yeah. Amazing. And, and thank you very much, Nick. And Jane, did you have a, so what was your first arrival in the polar regions and was there a sort of immediate sort of, this is my, this is my world? Uh, yes, I think what I, I started working in the Canadian Arctic, yeah. which is quite, it's less sort of dramatic than Antarctica, but there are fantastic animals and tundra and, and amazing sunlight. So the one thing that really struck mm. me is 24 hours of sunlight. And it's incredible how your human body responds to it because it's really bright light in the summer, 24 hours a day. And I found I didn't want, ever want to go to sleep. So it was a real problem because you sort of literally are wide eyed and really active, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. All day long. Sort of G'd up. And when, right. and when you're looking for fossils, you just keep going and going and going and going. And then you, you fall asleep because you're physically exhausted. But it is that sunlight, uh, that Plus continuous the clean light. air, the oh, clean yeah. air which yeah. makes the sun, sunshine yeah. even more yeah, amazing. bright and clear. And it? then I, as I've gone on, I really appreciated being remote. So, you know, <laughs> being at the ends of the earth where you can completely, completely close off. And I, I, it was interesting because I go to Antarctica now if I was a scientist in a camp and I found that three days I would forget about world news, I would forget about what was going on and there would just be me, there would just be me, the job I had to do with the fossils. And then the other thing you think about is the weather because that's risky and what you're going to have for dinner. Because yes, <laughs> that's that's really number important. One. Is, number one, really really important. number one. <laughs> yeah. well, Thank you very much for the chocolate you just brought on yeah. our station. That was very, very much appreciated. Uh, we, we have a, a question touching on, on all the things you've just been talking about, Jane. Um, and what can plant fossils from the Arctic tell us about the past and all the future? Well, it's really interesting because the, the plant fossils that we find in the Arctic are, if you like, the ancient ancestors of some of the forests that we find further south. Okay. And what we can do when we find plant fossils, we can use them to think about how vegetation has evolved over time. But we can also use features in the wood and the leaves to tell us what the actual temperatures were like and how much rainfall there was. Um, so, for example, in the Arctic, we know that 45 million years ago, there were forests very close to the uh, North Pole. Um, there were types of plants that we see today in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, further south though. And um, it was warm and it was also very wet. So we can see from the rock sediments and from the plant fossils that it was very wet. And of course, actually, that's what we're seeing today. That as a, And of course, the, at that point, the climate was much warmer from natural carbon dioxide coming out of volcanoes and natural processes much higher than it than it is uh, today um, and you know today in the arctic although it's icy outside one mm -hmm. of the things that we're seeing as a result of climate warming we're seeing as nick said we're seeing more rainfall yeah. and so we're getting a much wetter climate so you know we can look at what how co2 affects our climate and we can look into the past to see when there were higher levels of co2 and what the earth was like then and can I just sort of pick up on a, on a little bit of these, one of the themes that's been running through some of what you've been talking about on, on the climate questions has, has been this rate of change um, that that's, has particularly concerned you. What, why, why is the speed of the change? Why does that matter? If we've seen these things in the past, why does it matter if mm. it changes faster or slower? Well, the natural cycles go at a certain pace in the past so geologically you know it's a different time scale but we can work them out but what's happening at the moment is we have 400 419 parts a million of carbon dioxide but we have a landscape outside which is like our old uh, our old ice age landscape cool. of about 300 parts a million so uh, this ice formed in a world of sort of 300 parts million. Now we're way outside that. So the earth is a bit of an unbalanced state. And so I think it's doing, it's got to do something quite quickly to catch up with a world that looks like a 400 parts per million world. So this is where geology comes in okay. and looking at the rock record. And when we look back at our last 400 ppm CO2 world, which is about two to three million years ago in a geological epoch called the Pliocene epoch, we see that uh, the rocks tell us that there were much smaller ice sheets on Antarctica. 
there was hardly any ice in the Arctic. The Arctic ice is very young, actually, geologically speaking. And we can tell that sea levels are much higher because there was less mm. ice. So we can look back and see what is coming to us in the future. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm going to move away from, from climate to, to um, perhaps one of the most I iconic species up here. Mm. Um, Nick, sort of first of all, have you ever been up close with a polar bear? <laughs> oh, he's the right one to ask <laughs> yes. that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, inevitably, <laughs> inevitably being, you know, in these parts long enough, you do have an encounter with a polar bear. I mean, first of all, it said, I don't know how many hundred polar bears I've come across, and most of them pass you by, and and they're not a problem at all. And it's just so lovely to see them, these majestic and gorgeous creatures. You know, they really do rule the roost here. They adapted to this climate, and their largest mammal, I think, on Earth, or largest yeah. carnivore, sorry, largest carnivore. And um, it's just lovely to see them. Um, the only time I had a little bit of a short short. Uh, close haul with one was uh, it was a, a mother bear with a most beautiful little cub it was you know really cuddly looking little thing um, and they were wandering along on the sea ice and I would have been oh at least a kilometer away um, thought I was way out of range of her and that she wouldn't notice me but she did I probably caught caught the smell you know she's got a fantastic sense of smell and she turned and started coming and uh, towards me. But I thought, no, it's fine. She'll just turn. But she didn't. And then suddenly, very suddenly, she went from sort of fairly relaxed mode to very aggressive. And she went very low and ran. And it took her, you know, sort of probably 30 yards or 30 meters to really pick up speed. And then she went like a train and very fast train <laughs> and very low. And she was looking at me. And in those days, I did have a snow scooter, which sounds great because you just started and drive away. But in those days, <laughs> snow scooter, well, you know, snow scooters <laughs> of old, you pulled on the starter cord and you could pull and pull. And this one was not a good snow scooter. And uh, I was pulling like, so, like just to try and get it started. And to be honest, the whole drama, I don't know how close she was, but she was very close. And when I, you know, good, good view of her face. And to this day, I don't know why this happened, but the young bear ran away and she, who appeared to be looking straight to me, just sort of a flurry of snow and she turned and then just ran off with the cub. But she was very close at that point. I mean, I got a wonderful <laughs> view of the bear. But it, it must be said that quite often these things sound like terrible dramas and it's a bit like... If somebody drops into a, a crevasse on a rope and you, you, you stop them dropping in and, and so on, or somebody else stops you dropping in, it always sounds very dramatic and so on. And actually, at the time, it's not actually that bad. You're, you're just trying to do the right thing. And it, it always sounds more dramatic afterwards. I don't know. That sounds pretty good. Pretty scary <laughs> I mean, to me. So, I mean, so dropping into a crevasse is a sort of a, a normal... A, a normal occurrence for you, for you but <laughs> well, I know you'd be dog sledding as well, Nick. I, I mean, think, you know, yes, anybody who spends long enough on the ice, it's inevitable. It's it, try as we might, but the fact is, it's a bit like wearing a safety strap in a car. Okay. You know, if it does happen, then in most cases, you're you're fine. And and as I say, you keep on a tight rope, and you hardly notice that you dropped a crevasse, and and yeah. it's just fine. We we you know, we're so careful about all these sort yeah. of things. In the days of dog travel. It um, you had something like seventy feet of Greenland dogs, which are the largest of the sledge dogs, pulling your sled, and some people say that uh, the sledge dogs would sense that there were holes in the ground or some danger, which I don't think they actually did, but I think they knew when the dog driver was nervous because the the lead dog particularly would be very good at. Um, sticking to a route or whatever and every now and again you would a, a couple of dogs might drop down a down a hole and again it was no drama you put anchors in and went up and opened up the crevasse and of course crevasses are these huge cracks in the ice that go down you know maybe several hundred feet and you see these poor dogs penduluming down here on the end of their trace 
down like this, sort of going like this. But what was quite funny was it was sometimes two dogs that didn't actually like each other very much. So they're going like this, and despite all this danger, these blue walls of ice on the abyss below, they'd start growing at each other. So you'd be shouting now, Suka, be quiet, Suka, be quiet, and so on. And then pull about on you go. On you go. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much, thanks for, for sharing that and, and for, for the you know the, the calmness you've had in these in these situations. Um, following on from that is more about sort of polar, polar life, and this is a question from Harrow International School in Bangkok. Um, the question is very simply: What do you do during the day there? Is, is there such a thing as a typical day? Uh, in, 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 in the Arctic or Antarctic, yeah. So in Antarctica, what would you do? So first of all, um, we get up and have breakfast. And um, when I work with the British Antarctic Survey, we have sort of a, a food box of food, which is fairly standard. So you eat this sort of similar kind of food all the time. So, But it would definitely be a big bowl of porridge that would keep mm. you going with lots of jam in it and, uh, you know, milk. And then we would basically set out to work for the whole day, taking a packed lunch with us. and we were as geologists we were mapping rocks we were collecting fossils so we would work over miles and miles of ground walking collecting mapping looking observing that kind of thing um and and, and you know just doing doing science really yeah. collecting and then in the evening we would come back we'd have a radio call with our main station so that they made sure that we were safe and then we would cook our dinner and um we probably had to pack up the camp uh, pack up the fossils yeah. clear up the camp a little bit uh, make sure all our records were neat and tidy and clear uh, for that day because um, the next day you start all over again and then in because as nick said we don't have um well when i've been we've really been remote so you don't have any kind of email or anything like that although now you've got satellite phones in and you can use a satellite phone to connect to your laptop and get your email Marvin, which i Marvin. really think is terrible no, no, <laughs> terrible probably... yes and then and then most people are you know really really tired at the end of the day and you go to sleep sleep like sleep really really soundly in a nice warm tent yeah, nothing and, like it yeah and then you get up and do the same seven days a week and and how many of, of those you know how many weeks are there i mean how, how many weeks are you sort of living out in the sort of in on in the field for so in antarctica and i used to go was about for two months right. so yeah go into a field tent on on the area mm. where you want to work in the rocks where you want to work you know so there's no point in being a field no. station you work go to where you want to study the rocks and then you're there until the job's done which is about two months it's well, sort of in the summer one of the marvelous things isn't it i'm sure you'll experience this when you've been out for a two or three month field season in a tent and you come in or even shorter much shorter but you can be out for two weeks you come in and you're so used to walking around in soft snow. Or on hard rocks. Or on hard rocks. <laughs> but if you're in soft snow, you return to base eventually and uh, you open the door, arriving, this wall of warmth, Eat. Yeah. arriving back at the base station. And you suddenly find yourself at the far end of the corridor because your feet <laughs> have been pushing in the snow <laughs> for the last weeks or months and you just. <laughs> And you'd be down at the far end of the corridor. It yeah, yeah. always amazed me how you, quickly you could get about. But Nick, I mean, did, did you have a, a sort of, you were supporting science rather than doing the research. Was was there a typical day day for, well, for you? James. Stop um, the scientists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, but James uh, described beautifully uh, in a field camp. Yeah. And, and uh, on a base, um, it's bound to be a little bit different because you've got the base infrastructure that you're keeping going and, and, and you know, that's uh, a sort of everything from your power station through to providing electricity and so on, through to have carpenters and plumbers and all those sorts of things, which we have here in the Orison, just the same. But so you've got that side and then you've got the science side. So a, a, a typical day as it is here, when we have the scientists going out doing whatever they might be doing on the land on the tundra out on the sea out on the ice yeah. looking up in the atmosphere whatever it might be we we breakfast and then we gather um by that time looked at weather forecasts which are actually very good these days but build up a picture we've looked at the tides looked at the sea state i.e how rough it is at sea looked at the cloud level for those going up on the ice um, just you know, not too low, and be able to see where you're going, and look at the amount of ice that's out in yeah. in the area, and then it's a really a discussion of all the different project groups of what they're trying to achieve that day, 
we're always controlled by the weather. The Arctic and the Antarctic always has the, the last word. Yeah. So we, we just plan, 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 and then it's go, 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 and get as much done in the day as we can. Amazing. I mean, it sounds like an incredibly varied job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you, the weather probably dictates lots of it, but then there's, there's, there's so many, you know, yeah. not, not, no two days the same. What is lovely, I think, and I'm sure you agree with this, is that, that, that we're all doing quite often quite different things, but we're all working together mm. to achieve that one thing. You know, whether you're a carpenter doing that, your chef doing that, your uh, a boatman, your uh, whatever the job might be, all the different scientists, whether you're a glaciologist or marine person, geologist, whatever it might be, there's so much collaboration and having to work together and that builds the, and in this severe climate mm -hmm. and it's the most wonderful sort of feel good factor because um, everybody's really working hard to make it make it a success yeah, yeah yeah and do you get that feeling now as director of the organization that the that sort of unity oh. of purpose and all mm -hmm. the different specialists that are working at bass absolutely i think um you know everybody shares that very special experience of of being in the polar regions and it is a really unique experience it's quite hard to describe to somebody else and and so i think that what we call ourselves the bass family because i think mm. we share yeah. the, oh, the experience absolutely, absolutely. yeah the the top question that's coming up next is what back 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 to an interesting in climate and and the question is what is being done um to reduce uh our uh climate footprint or our carbon footprint and you should be on this Just gonna, this. so yeah so this is a big topic for us at the moment you know the british government wants to, and um, and you know i hope all governments around the world there's some more than others but certainly for us and our organization uh we want to reduce our carbon footprint so we are thinking of ways that we can change our activities, both in travel, but also say in Antarctica, how can we change the way we work? So, and, and the way we live down there, um, we're just building a new station building. So we want to make it as ca low carbon as, as possible. So we have a lot of renewable energy. So we've got solar panels everywhere. Um, we're trying out lots of different new technology. Um, we could put up wind turbines, but in fact, the problem with wind turbines is that the wind is so <laughs> strong in Antarctica yeah. that it breaks them. No, I've, I've, I've experienced this first, <laughs> yeah. first hand. Yeah, so we're trying to find different um, new technologies that we can use yeah. to, to cut our fuel bill. And of course, we have a research ship, which is absolutely critical for um, work in the oceans and uh, and carrying our logistics. So we can't do without the ship that gets there. So how can we make that less fuel hungry so what we're doing is we're investing in a lot of um small what we call autonomous vehicles okay. so small little robotics so the ship itself may you know in the old days the ship would do a track like that to take data recordings but it will sit still and not use so much fuel but we'll launch out there some of these small robotics and some go down through the oceans and use wave energy some are battery energy and some sail what we call sail boys they like tiny little well, like tiny little sailing ships and they have an echo sounder on the keel of them in the bottom that can sense where the krill and all what the things we're interested in the fish swarms and they have a little sail on them and so we set them off on a gps task mm -hmm. and it's a, a clever little boat and it just can go off for years almost mm -hmm. it's got a solar panel to run the echo sounder and it just goes and it tacks in the wind it's very clever and it doesn't use any it, hardly any energy at all and then in, we also launch things into the air now so we're using drones um to be able to take pictures of say um you know penguins in 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 their in their numbers so instead of a person having to be there be taken there and then have to spend a long time uh, you know in a camp counting all the penguins which is very difficult when you're actually there we can just use satellites or drones to, to record so we're using a lot of different technology to decrease our carbon footprint in the polar regions. Thank you very much. I mean, it sounds like there's a whole, whole range of things to be, and being done and to hear about that innovation in science practice um, yeah. is also wonderful as well. Uh, very sadly, we've only got time for a, for a few more questions. Um, just just to, 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 to take them sort of 
Uh, one excitement one and one science one, I think, if we have have that. Um, Nick, I'm going to ask you, um, have any accidents happened or any incidents or accidents happened during during your expeditions over the past I mean, decade? Inevitably, there are some sort of accidents, but um, nothing of any sort of note. We're extremely careful. careful. We have so many systems in place. Mm. Um, it's very unprofessional if... An accident does happen. Obviously, this is the moral thing. We don't want it to happen, but it's it's also very unprofessional. So we just have so many um, policies and procedures in place that ensure... And training. And training. That's mm. the number one. You're absolutely right. Training followed by assessment. That, that, that mm. Once we've trained somebody in whatever the field might be, we then watch and assess how they're doing and then build up its... Um, it, it, it's all down to really learning and, and learning how to live in this sort of rather unusual climate and and people become more and more professional in what they do and and as they become more professional they do more and more science or whatever it is they're doing so yeah it's it's uh, mm. uh we don't just have people who come in and and set off and do some science like that it's a very gradual thing to get uh, people equipped and ready there's a lot of training a lot of training and and what's wonderful about what you described in in the past is 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 that you know the dogs and the crevasse is that all that training you nobody nobody concerned yeah. what somebody uh, watching it you know in the school might think of of as an incident it's actually something that you or your it, it is an incident and it but, must be yeah. said that it, it's rather ancient history as well now yeah. we've moved on from mm. that era into the use of snow scooters and we yeah. still pull sledges of course and that sort of thing but again it's um so many other measures that are in place and bits of technology that we can use mm. that make things safer mm. thank you very much nick uh jane um last question um very sadly of this q a is have you ever discovered a new species um i have actually yes wow. um but it was a very long time ago when i was doing my early research and it wasn't in the Antarctic or Arctic. Uh, we have discovered new species, but it wasn't particularly me. Um, but I have discovered, and when I, um, when I was doing some work in the UK, actually, on the fossil forests on yeah. the Dorset coast, and I was working one day and I found some um, fossil wood, fossil leaves that hadn't been discovered before, and bits of fossil plants, and put it together to reconstruct the tree that lived in these forests uh, 150 million years ago in the south coast of of the UK and so that was my first new species yes amazing um how did it feel to this it was good yes yeah. to sort of be able actually what was really interesting was that it was kind of like a bit of a jigsaw puzzle geology is a bit like a detective story you have to go out there and find all the clues and you don't have all the bits of the jigsaw but you put together what you can and um you build a picture of what life was like in the past so i think most of the time when i'm doing field work my head is in a different world <laughs> dinosaurs are walking around and they're a thick forest really, even though i'm walking really. walking across a whole rocky cliff yes uh, dinosaurs up here yes swell yeah. dinosaurs uh, yeah oh yes they're very famous dinosaurs very on, on Svalbard. yes they're jurassic, fjord, aren't they? yeah they're jurassic uh, uh, reptiles yeah ancient reptiles in Antarctica, we have dinosaurs in the ocean, big marine reptiles in the ocean, and, and dinosaurs on land. Yes, uh, we're gonna have, have another one of these. I want now. I want to find out what about dinos, dinosaurs, dinosaurs as well. Thank you both so so much uh, for being part of Arctic Live. It's, it's been amazing uh, to hear all of your experiences, your insights into the science, your description of life in the cold uh and and obviously your huge passion and enjoyment of these very special parts of our planet so thank you both very much again thank you, it's a pleasure thank and you thank much. you very much uh to everyone uh who's been watching sending in your fantastic questions great questions great questions really great questions so thank you uh until next week we are back on tuesday uh for a series of meet a scientist uh, live lessons we'll be hearing all about how to get into science um, whether that be in the polar regions or elsewhere until then it's a very sad goodbye from axa arctic live for the weekend bye bye, bye, -bye.